Well, hello. I am Pastor Meg Gaston, and I'm serving as an associate pastor at Centenary United Methodist here in Winston-Salem. And I'm talking today with the absolutely fabulous Mark DeVries. He is one of our friends from Ministry Incubators and a national and international leader in Christian social innovation. Mark was a longtime pastor, associate pastor for youth and their families at First Presbyterian Church in Nashville, and is now the head of ministry architects in one of the Western North Carolina Conference's partners, Ministry Incubators, not to mention one of my all-time favorite people. Mark, we are so grateful for all that you are doing in this partnership with us. I remember first meeting you when I was in seminary and being inspired by the way you were able to connect with so many people in such a short amount of time. I think we played some kind of game of 20 questions, but abbreviated at the lunch table in the cafeteria, if I'm remembering correctly. And I thought, this man, how interesting. Strange man. I did think strange, but I also thought it makes sense that he's in youth ministry completely. (laughs) So I would love to dive a little deeper into what your experience in the Christian innovation space has looked like. And I am sure that there are too many to count or even name, but can you share one of your favorite success stories from working with others in this space? Yeah, you bet. Let me just give a little on-ramp to to this work. Um, We, uh, you know, we're all, there's a pretty clear consensus that um, that we just can't keep doing church like we've been doing. And uh, that is clear. What's not clear is what the next iteration will be. You, you probably know, you know, that Phyllis Tickle in one of her books five or six years ago said that every 500 years, there's a sort of a, a, a turnover and a reinvention of, of Christianity in the Christian church. And she, she argues, and I think she's right, that, that we are in one of those seasons right now. And, um, and so there are two responses um, that we're seeing. One is church is sort of holding a death grip on the way it used to be. Can't we just go back? Why can't we go back? Can't we bounce back to 1970 when we had the choir tours with all the kids going out? And can't we just, can't we just go back? And the and so that death grip really is a it's a it's a death sentence. I mean, it, it's a way for churches to stay in decline. The other thing we see is churches, and some of them have been forced into this by the pandemic. We see churches that that are saying, "Well, let's try something," <laughs> and and really that's the foundation. It's sort of the foundational risk of this work is um, that we've got to. Uh, we got to be willing to try things that may not work. And most churches would much rather go back to the thing that's not working that they know how to do well than try something to be a beginner, to get that beginner's mind and start over again and learn something new. Um, So we can talk more about that. But your real question was uh, one of one of our favorites. Um, uh, Yeah, we had a uh, we do these things called hatchathons where people with these uh, sort of odd uh, outside the box ideas for ministry come together. Uh, We spend three days together. They, they, uh, we walk them through, you know, uh, eight or nine modules of uh, that, that'll be required of any sort of missional innovation. And, uh, and then by the time they're done, they sort of have a ministry slash business plan to get this thing off the ground. So at one of these hatchathons, uh, you know, maybe five years ago, it was probably at the same time we were at seminary and you and I were, you were asking me 20 questions at the, uh, at the dining hall, right? I think it was three random questions you asked and I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, nice to meet you. You did a really nice job with those questions, by the way. Mm-hmm. So, um, uh, there we were at Princeton Seminary doing a hatchathon sponsored by the continuing ed department there. And uh, uh, a guy named Matt McNelly, who is a graduate of Princeton, who is a, uh, a head of staff at a church in, um, you know, in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, like many churches, their church was struggling with a, a shrinking budget. 
And so um, Matt and his wife share uh, shared a, pos a position and a half, basically. And the congregation said, we're going to have to cut you all down to a one position total between the two of you. And, you know, they had these habits like eating and having a place to live. And right. so Matt, <laughs> Matt began to think, uh, you know, he's probably just got, either got to get another job. They got to get another call. And uh, and then he read that the dam people, these are the people who run the dams on the Snake River and the, sorry, I was trying not to be inappropriate, uh, on, the, uh, on the Snake River and the Columbia River, because of the, the dams, the pike minnows had, had grown, their population had grown so much that they were literally eating, uh, they were killing and eating millions of salmon fingerlings. So these are little baby salmons. And so the, because the whole industry, the whole economy in that area depends on salmon, um, the, the dam people are offering $8 a fish for any, any pike minnow that gets caught. So first Matt thinks, eh, I'll just go fish and that can supplement our income. And then he decides, well, maybe I'll make this a part of our youth ministry. So he, he goes and gets a boat, he buys, buys, a, buys a boat, and then for the summer, he invites, <laughs> he invites his youth group, and of course, all kind of kids outside of the youth group, onto the boat, he teaches them how to fish, they make money, he makes money, and, and in fact, after a couple of years, the congregation says, we want to, you're reaching so many kids in our community, we want to fund an additional $20,000 to you because of the ministry you're doing in the community, the church that had no money, right? Right, right. Um, it's called Go Fish. I mean, you can look it up. Uh, oh, that's great. So that, that's that's one of my favorite stories. That's awesome. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, and also fun card game too, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Very youth ministry appropriate. I got so, it. So as an innovator extraordinaire, I'm wondering what are the few things that you have learned yourself from innovating, but also from watching what other innovators are doing in their own time or on their own thing? Um, one of the big surprises, Meg, is the um, is how often it it works. <laughs> I mean, we we sort of expect that about one out of ten, you know, new ideas for ministry are actually going to stick. You know, you may do may do it one time, and then you go, know, I don't think we're ever going to do that again. Um, but we have we have found that the folks that are walking through this a very deliberate process, um, a, a surprising number of them. You know, I I, I don't I don't have a, a ratio, but I'm I'm sure it's close to one in you know one in two. Uh, at least half of them are still doing their thing, and. Um, and, so, you know, we're, we probably worked with, I don't know, 150, 200 different projects like this. And the, the other exciting thing is, you know, we've had to, we have, we've had to sort of make a pivot because there was this pandemic. And I don't know if you've read about that, I've, but I've heard about it a little bit. But. Yeah. And, uh, and so we had to turn uh, from our three day on site experience to a three-day uh, virtual experience. So, you know, people, when, when people think about being on Zoom for, you know, six hours a day for three days, um, that is not something they're really looking forward to. I, but one of the, I try to do that weekly. Yeah. <laughs> Personally. Personally, yeah. So, um, we, what we found is when you get these created people together um, who are all working on different projects, there's something that just pops. And uh, every time we have done one of these online experiences, people have ended the time, you know, as we're wrapping up saying, I was not looking forward to 21 hours on Zoom, uh, but I'm walking away from this uh, energized by by the people that that I've been around, you know what they identify is there. It's so easy to get caught up in the heaviness of, of all the all that has to be done in ministry. 
that uh, being around people who are trying to dream up uh, new ways of reaching people for Christ, that creates this buzz and this beautiful kind of kind of fellowship and support for each other. So um, those are, uh, you know, a couple of things that we've learned. Yeah, just a couple. So with that, when they come into the space, what do you think, or what do y'all usually try to suggest or recommend to people who are starting out with this and want to be innovative? Like what kind of approaches should they take? Do you see more success from people who walk in obviously with an open mind, but is there other, are there other things that people, it's better that they walk into the room knowing or being ready for? Yeah. Well, we like for folks to come with, with an idea. Like we want, we want to do this particular thing, you know, um, Mandy Drury, uh, one of our, one of our dear colleagues was wanted to come just to observe. Uh, and when she walked in the room, we said, you can't just observe, you need to, you need to play with an idea. So she, she came up with on the spot, this idea that she's called the brain kitchen, which is sort of a, a cooking program for uh, at-risk kids that provides an after-school space for them. They learn to cook and then they um, then they can take some of that food home and then they distribute it out. By the time we finished the three days, she was so committed to it that she said, well, I just need to do this. Fast forward a few years, the city has given her a building on the town square next to the library. They've got a full-time staff person running the brain kitchen. So I'll uh, the, the key thing we want to have people do is bring something to try. Uh, and what we know is the first way we think about the thing we're doing is never going to be the way it ends up. Right. But we, but you like, like when you're on a sailboat, you just can't turn unless you're moving. And it's a, it's a term that your friend, my, my colleague, uh, Ken Dean refers to as solvatore ambulando. It's the only Latin I know, which oh, means it is, yeah, it is solved while walking. Huh. Is that great? So you, yeah, that's you, wonderful. Some things we can't figure out by writing a plan. We have to get moving. And, um, and so a willingness not just to talk and have a meeting, but to actually do something is, is where the energy tends to come from. Yeah, that's great. And I've seen that at work when we've, we've had some innovator table meetings with y'all and Kenda's like, everyone brainstorm for two minutes on what this can look like. And then let's all come together. And then we talk about it and what everyone suggests, something morphs into something else, but it's never what anybody first suggested. So yeah. Yeah. What a great approach to ministry, Mark. And we are just so thankful for y'all and all that you're doing for our conference right now. Is there any Last words, follow up, anything you'd like to add that you think people need to know? Well, I do think that the folks in the Western North Carolina Conference need to know that they are, they are years ahead of other, other conferences, other denominations in terms of their intentionality about uh, innovative approaches to ministry. Y you probably know this, that Luke and the, the Fresh Expressions sort of emphasis, they have, you know, I think over a hundred different fresh expressions that they're cultivating right now. And then there, there are a variety of other streams that are happening. You know, the work that Joel is doing at Wesley CDC, there is, it, the Western North Carolina Conference is really an incubator for the future of the church. And and I just think, you know, if you're, if you're busy just doing the work of the church and preparing sermons every week and doing what you do as a pastor, you sometimes don't know what the, what the rest of the, you know, how, how you look to the rest of the world. Exactly. And, uh, and it's pretty, it, you know, we just continue to be blown away by the, the um, courage and commitment, uh, the willingness um, to, to try things and, uh, and again, a surprising number of them are actually working. Um, yeah. so we're, we're thrilled to be a part of that process and thrilled to get to work with you in that process. Yeah, thanks. And same, same for us. I think on behalf of the entire conference, which I often speak for, 
Uh, we <laughs> thank y'all so much. Kidding. Um, yeah, for all the work you do in this partnership. And I know uh, I enjoy doing the work and I know it's, it's working and people are loving what they do and it's bringing ministry to life in new ways that maybe five years ago we never would have thought possible. So yeah. okay. thanks so much, Mark. Great to be with you. Thanks for uh, making time and uh, we'll look forward to seeing what continues to unfold. Yeah, sounds good.